It's November 4th, 1993, after the engagement. Here in the mid-continent, Ama Jamal, in the year 1993, it's good to see you again. Lay, uh, old pal, old friend, <laughs> and certainly uh, a seasoned veteran of this business. It's always a pleasure seeing you and talking to you. Thank you, Ahmed. You know, I've been thinking all the way back to Pittsburgh and your early days at Westinghouse High. There was a, a woman there who was very important, I think, in your life. And uh, perhaps she was one of the first ones to open the door for you I I in the field of music. Well, the, the first one was my mother. And then from her, uh, I discovered uh, a lady, Mary Codwell Dawson, on Apple Avenue. In fact, that's why I wrote the uh, uh, composition, Apple Avenue, that's on one of my releases. And this is where I struggled to take those lessons that my poor mother saved uh, $1 a week for, which was like $100 a week then. This is 1937. A like, remarkable woman. Both of them, my mother as well as uh, Mary Codwell Dawson, who founded the first Afro-American opera company and was instrumental in putting Afro-Americans in the Metropolitan Opera. And there's not been an, uh, uh, an opera company like that since. And, uh, uh, you know, my wonderful mother, Earl Garner, and, and Earl Garner's mother and her were friends all as well. So uh, Pittsburgh provided a, a very rich background, to say the least, just in those two ladies alone. Not to mention all the other people, Art Blakey and, and uh, Billy Strayhorn, whose family I sold papers to, and uh, Earl Hines and Roy Eldridge and Billy Eckstein and uh, Ray Brown, and, uh, later on George Benson and Stanley Turrentine, Earl Wilde, the exponent of Liszt, and it goes on and on. And Maxine Sullivan. Mary Lou Williams, Dodo Mama Rosa, whom the world has forgotten, but I haven't. Nor have I. <laughs> <laughs> Summit Ridge Drive and... In fact, I got a letter from Artie Shaw today, uh, incidentally. I didn't know he was still around, but he is. Very much uh, uh, behind the scenes, but uh, inspiring uh, his legacy. That's right. So Pittsburgh, uh, as I said before, is one of my, still one of my favorite places. I certainly don't deny it as my hometown. Well, you've w written a wonderful suite describing the city, too, and we might just touch on that. Yeah, that's used in the uh, new... Uh, a museum of Science there. It's one of the, uh, uh, in fact, it's part of the soundtrack there when you go to Pittsburgh. There's a little plaque in the museum that uh, acknowledges the fact that uh, they're using uh, a bit of my music uh, in their film there. It is in a city, of course, with great history, and you've mentioned really a whole segment of American classical music that just really has been been inspired by those players and those artists that have come from that city. When you think about it, what what nourished that musical development and, and made it really work with so many artists who were, you know, born there and grew up there and traveled the world, made their mark? Well, not only uh, did the city nourish these great talents, uh, uh, Lay, but what is even more unique is that everyone that comes from Pittsburgh has his or ho her own unique style. If you just reflect on the singers, Phyllis Hyman, okay, Dakota Staten. So I haven't gotten to, to those people yet. Uh, Billy Strayhorn, whose writing was certainly different and still remains different from anyone else's. Here's a guy who wrote uh, uh, Lush Life and was talking about a weekend in Paris and had never been to Paris in his life. He was only 16 when he wrote that. Uh, Earl Garner, another distinct individual, to say the least, one of the great contributors, 20th century, contributors to 20th century music. Billy Eckstein, Ray Brown is still unique, still has his own, there's no one who plays bass like him. George Benson, everyone that Stanley Turrentine, everyone that comes from Pittsburgh not only has uh, 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 this great rich background, but it's uncanny, it's a phenomenon that everyone, Art Blakey, Kenny Clark, okay, they are all different and they, they have resounding voices everywhere they go. Uh, they're uh, 
contributions heard around the world. And that is a remarkable thing. There are other pockets in that country like that, but I don't think there are any stronger po pockets. I think Pittsburgh certainly is one of the, the strongest, uh, among the strongest pockets for that s sort of phenomenon, music phenomenon. And uh, when Andre Previn decided to conduct, that's where he went to conduct. He conducted the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra for years. Is it in the uh, embedded in the in the in the school system and in the families as well? Uh, you know, uh, I don't know what is the uh, uh, catalytic uh, the, the catalytic agent for this type of phenomena. Uh, maybe it's the water. Maybe it's the hills. Could be the steel mills. Could be the coal mines. And of course, there's some great industrialists there: Mellon, Westinghouse. And it goes Hines, 57. It's a remarkable city. Here. And uh, uh, about 10 or 11 years ago, it was about the most livable city in the United States. Of course, I don't live there anymore, but I always love going back. Ahmed Jamal, uh, on another tack, um, yours is a very special signature. Your compositions, your performance, the music materials you select, when it comes to music materials, aside from composition, when you select something that is uh, really written by someone else, uh, is there any special principle or criteria that you follow to select a piece of material for performance? Well, I select pieces or compositions that have a story content lay. If they don't have a story content that I cannot relate, all, all the things I, I write of my own have a story content because it, it constitutes basically the story of my life, which is quite vivid and quite involved. Uh, the other songs, some of which I learned before I, uh, were written before I was born, I resurrect songs that were written before I, I was born simply because I had an aunt that sent me reams and reams of sheet music. That's when the sheet music, when the publishing business was sheet music. And I've retained those songs that tell a story. Uh, I, I, I try to select the, the strongest story. That's what, that's what I try to do. That's my criteria. So it is the storyline. Uh, how about melodic content? Yeah, well, well uh, that is, to me, all integrated, you know, because uh, the uh, the melody and the lyrical line are, are whole to me, if it contains lyrics. And an example of, of what I'm talking about, one of the greatest uh, 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 balladeers uh, instrumentally was, was uh, Ben Webster. Mary Lou was crazy about him, I was crazy about him. In fact, I still have a pair of cufflinks that Ben gave me. And we did a film together, Robert Harris Theaters, you know, many, many years ago. But Ben was playing this beautiful, beautiful ballad as only he could play and a few others like Don Byers and Lucky Thompson. And he stopped right in the middle and they said, why did you stop Ben? He said, I forgot the words. <laughs> Do you think in terms of lyrics? Oh, you have to, you have to. Most of the songs, I don't know them as a Billy Eckstein would know them or as a Johnny Hartman would have, uh, late Johnny, both of them have gone now with uh, uh, approaches lyrics, but I, I, I know just about what the lyrical content is, and I'm, I'm listening to the lyrics as I play. Oh, yeah. And that goes back to your, uh, your thoughts about the storyline. Oh, n no question about it. Uh, 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 Charlie Parker was a master storyteller. Dizzy Gillespie, his night in Tunisia, is, is a... a story and it 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 strikes of a night in Tunisia and uh, wouldn't you all those things uh, a con album all those things that the the, the great uh, uh, instrumentalists write uh, uh, t are, are great stories Ahmed Jamal as you uh, look over the decades here I look over these decades with you uh, we have two distinct and different points of view I work in the electronic media and you truly work in the arts and uh, the electronic media has not always done its uh, or fulfilled its mission uh, uh, communicating in your behalf as an artist. Uh, here it is 1993 and you've watched uh, the world 
and the music you develop, American classical music, jazz. Where has it been? Where do you think it's going? Well, I always uh, uh, say this, Lay. Um, Mother Jazz will outlive all her children. It is the greatest contributor to contributed to the smattering of culture that we have in the United States in addition to American Indian art which is also still underrated as a culture contributor. Those are the only two art forms that developed in this country. Maybe cinema I'll give a third spot to but I, I think principally in terms of American Indian art and this great uh, giant American classical music. As you know, I started that phrase years ago and now it's catching on. Uh, we, what we have done is sophisticated, a very unsophisticated word. I'm not paranoid about the word jazz, but I think something that has contributed as much culture as it has to the world, not only the United States, to the world, uh, deserves a, a, a little better line than just jazz because uh, uh, there's a piece of computer out for an example that's called jazz it has nothing to do with music so uh, uh, this uh, American classical music slash, slash jazz uh, will outlive all the uh, children that it has created and some of the children are quite bad <laughs> I, I think they're little monsters <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're in for a uh, a great cultural shock, Lake Cameron, if we don't teach our children about the Billie Holidays, about the Louis Armstrongs, about the Benny Goodmans, and the uh, Petersons, Sharon, Jamals, and all the people, the Brubecks that make up this industry, we're in for a terrible cultural shock. And uh, let's uh, uh, save the children. I'm a Jamal. Uh, I'll campaign with you to save the children. It's so good to see you. There is a little snow coming down, and that's not unfamiliar to you. I uh, just want to say through the years, what a pleasure to touch down, touch base, and uh, feel that great humane leadership that you exude from the keyboard, as well as from those eyes and that smile that you warm the world with. Well, it's been great, Leigh, and uh, cut out the bad parts in this interview. <laughs>